I'm super excited because today we have a guest on the channel. He's an amazing upright bass player and electric bass player, so I think he's the perfect person to talk to about some of the differences between the instruments and what makes the upright bass a unique and cool instrument. He knows a lot more about upright bass than me, and I'm just really thankful to, to have him here today. So I'm going to learn with you guys. And uh, without further ado, welcome Mr. Kelly McCarty. Just to kind of show some of the difference in tone between these instruments, we'll just like let you play something on electric and something on upright. We can compare them. Cool. What would you say to the electric bass player that says, I can make my electric bass sound like an upright bass? You saying they can or they want to? Well, that's the question. Oh. Uh, good luck. <laughs> you're not getting an acoustic tone. Um, it's always gonna sound like some kind of DI, uh, always gonna sound like you're plugging into something. You're never just gonna like, you know, play a fretless bass or a bass that's through an amp and get the same kind of thing. How do you choose which which instrument you're going to use for which gig. I mean, that's purely on the style of music. And for the most part, you know, the person that it, it's their gig, they're going to tell you. So usually it's just good to ask sometimes if there's a gray area. Obviously, if it's like a rock gig, I'm not going to show up with this thing. But, you know, if it's a little ambiguous, like if it's, you know, jazz adjacent or something like that, or like a fusion thing, you know, you just want to be clear, like, hey, is this, you know, upright or electric? Which one do you want? Sometimes I'll say both. Do your musical ideas translate differently with the different instruments? Yeah, and that's purely just because, like, you don't shed a lot of, like, upright players on electric and vice versa. So, like, you know, I think I've shed maybe some James Brown on this thing or some Jamerson, but that's about it. Okay. So, like, the ideas on this thing and how to get around is purely just like learning licks and learning tunes that are upright centric anyways. It's not gonna be appropriate for me to play electric stuff on like a, an upright gig. It's just really about being appropriate. How is the technique different than electric bass? I, I see a lot of electric players when they switch over. I was actually just talking to a, a student about this the other day, um, where they're still trying to do this thing. And that's not bad or like, you're not gonna go to bass jail for that or anything, but it's not gonna get the same amount of like oomph out of this instrument that you could get. And so what you end up doing a lot of the times and actually have them switch up their electric technique to a little more like this. Okay. So that angle? Yeah, and a that's little more. for electric, this gets these two fingers kind of the same length and how they hit the string. Mm -hmm. So I'll have them switch that 
and then when they get back on upright the main thing is is that you want to take this and do even more so literally i'm kind of gripping it here and gripping underneath with the thumb oh, okay so it's like more like the side of the finger yeah, it's it not really the fingertips is. it's really not because like you just don't get enough meat on that thing to pull that hard okay so it's like the maximum surface area yeah exactly do you apply that same technique to electric or no that thing's a lot more finesse and that's kind of why i have people switch to like a more angled thing there so that you know they're still getting that kind of like smaller finesse motion but when they get back to upright this isn't such a big deal and the other thing i would say that i see a lot of electric players doing is that they sit up here which is just really not going to get you enough tone and enough you really want like a good pointed attack and the way you're going to get that is just down here okay so closer yeah almost to the to edge the of the finger you can even kind of see some of my gross fingerprint marks from okay. playing down here so the sweet spot is kind of at the end of the neck there yeah it's just like if you think about your electric you're playing where the pickups are like kind of down by the bridge anyway so if you're playing up here this is almost like reggae land on electric where you're playing up where the fingerboard starts so you just want to be down here Really kind of give it the business okay cool you can even kind of see like i'm playing this as if i'm just closing this circuit there just happens to be a string in the way left hand is actually really quite similar my teacher at florida state rodney jordan taught me about the the buzz he calls it which is something you can do on electric too um where you literally just want to find the right amount of pressure like the exact amount of pressure you need and all you got to do to do that on upright or electric is literally to just pluck a note and then slowly lift off. You can kind of hear like, when you start to hear that, that means you need to just put the tiniest bit more pressure down to get the optimum amount of pressure over here. Uh -huh. And that makes sure that not only are you not over pressing or under pressing, um, but you're getting the right amount of bone on the string and keeping, you know, keeping yourself from having too much meat on the string, which is actually gonna deaden the tone and deaden the the length of the note as well so like okay just literally like finding the buzz and then press a little harder just a little bit away. harder aside from that um there's two other things you want to keep in mind one being i don't know if you can get this but uh you kind of want to keep your thumb right in the middle of the of the uh the neck oh i see as opposed to this kind of like almond brothers thing that you kind of do on electric sometimes and for the most part you want to keep it behind your second finger okay. your middle finger and it's really the same thing we just talked about with the, the right hand where you're just kind of closing this circuit. There just happens to be a base in the way. The only other thing, and this is probably the biggest thing with your left hand, is that on electric, you kind of, you're, you're able to get away with like, like one finger per note, one finger per fret. Uh -huh. On upright, especially up here, you really don't have that much reach. You really only have like a whole step or like two frets. Yeah, because that's like one of the things that I think was intimidating for me when I started oh, getting yeah. curious about upright is <laughs> is how massive the neck is and how big the jumps are. Yeah, it's a lot of work to just kind of get the geography down, but that's the big thing is like you really only have a whole step reach, even kind of when you get up here. So the trick to that is, is just when you're here um, and before you get up to like what would be 12th fret or this harmonic right here, you just want to ditch your third finger altogether. Just don't really? just don't use it. Everything's ah. got to be like Once you get up here in the thumb, you want to ditch your pinky. So And that's really just going to help you stay in tune. There's no frets. And there's also no lines. Yes, so how do you fun part. find it? Um, so a lot of people are going to tell you, um, just think of there being frets on there, <laughs> like visualize it. And that's cool and all, but it's not very practical for what you're doing. Just find the harmonics, because the harmonics aren't going to lie. So mm. like, if you've got open G, there's your 12th fret, that harmonic right there. Mm -hmm. And that's going to help you with target practice, as I call it, where you just literally take your hand off the bass and try to find that note out of thin air. For those that maybe don't know what a harmonic is, what is that? Um, it's literally you not pushing down all the way, 
and kind of cutting the string up mathematically. So yeah. this harmonic right here. So you're is, not even touching the fretboard, you're just playing. Yeah, and yep. the trick is to kind of not put your finger straight on it, but just a little to the side and then pull off as soon as you hit it. I called it a fretboard, but there's no frets. <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato. But like this harmonic, you're cutting the string in half. Uh -huh. This one, you're cutting it into thirds. This one's into fourths. And then it appears a bunch of other garbage too. But <laughs> but anyway, so this harmonic is going to give you that note. Um, this one here is going to give you a nice solid D, which is the string below it as well. So you can kind of check the intonation. Yeah. So it's almost like the harmonics are telling you where the fret, yeah. the imaginary frets are. Exactly. This would be 24. <laughs> and then on and on and on. And there's whole classical pieces that just make you sit up here and do that kind of stuff. But uh, for the most part, that, that harmonic thing is going to be what breaks your neck up enough for you to kind of learn where things are. How much money realistically do they need to set apart to have something that's not going to be terrible and also where would they find it the absolute maximum i would ever spend on like someone's first upright bass is 1200 should probably be looking more in the six to eight hundred or even just like you probably know someone who would let you borrow one so like borrow it for a couple weeks see if it's your thing and if it's not give it back <laughs> You gotta really love this thing. That I tell people this is like the worst girlfriend you're ever gonna have. Um, you have to spend time with it. It's not like electric where you can just not play it for a couple months and come back and be just fine. If I don't play this thing for like a week, it's a noticeable difference Really, when I come back to it. So yeah, just see if you can borrow one, but like don't, don't go overboard. Not only are these things hard to find near you, but they're hard to sell again if you don't want it. So mm. don't take a bath on the resale. Capturing the sound of this instrument can be a little bit intimidating. Uh, and it seems like there's a couple of ways to do it. And you might do it different ways if you're on stage as opposed to in the recording studio. So how do you like to, to capture the sound of this acoustic instrument on stage? And how do you like to do it when you're recording? So again, it really kind of depends on the gig. If you're doing like a big stage gig, you probably want to try to get the sound person to get you some kind of mic. Um, and they're probably going to want to take a DI out of your pickup as well. In a bigger setting like that, you're probably going to have both and they're going to mix in probably 70 to 80% mic and then 10 to 20% DI. Um, and that actually is pretty typical in like a recording session too where they're gonna pull a DI out, but they're gonna mic you up with something really nice, and they're probably gonna blend the two just about the same ratio. Smaller gigs, it's not too practical to like bring a mic setup and all that, and bring an amp and try to get it balanced out to where you're not feeding back and all that junk. Um, so th that gig is gonna call for more like a DI, like a pickup like that. Um, just cause it's going to be easier and you don't need to be so loud out of the amp anyway. So you're still like the audience is still going to hear some of that acoustic tone. Um, so you're kind of doing the same thought process where you're blending your natural sound out, your natural volume with like a little bit of amp and you don't need something too big for that. Um, I've even used like a 10 inch QSC on that thing. So a, Q a QSC, that's like a powered. PA speaker, right? Yes, so you're just, just a saying PA speaker. not a bass amp, just like a little power speaker. Yeah, because that thing, when you're doing that, it shouldn't be the main thing that people hear. It should just be really kind of, you know, helping out the sound you're already getting. When I got to school, my teacher told me to put my amp in the closet and leave it there for two years. So, like, I did all my gigs with no amp. So that probably helped you get that volume. Yeah, literally by the end of things, he was like, yo, you're too loud. <laughs> wow. Um, so again, the amp should only really be helping the sound. It shouldn't be the sound. And that's really what you want to go for. Do you ever run into situations where you can't hear yourself? Like the band's too loud and you can't turn up anymore because of feedback. Does that ever happen? That's a fun question because like I'm really spoiled and I get to play with really good musicians. If I can't hear myself which is rare because this thing is this this particular bass is just stupid loud to begin with but if you play with good musicians especially like on an acoustic gig if you can't hear yourself you actually go the opposite direction 
and if you start if you start here and you can't hear yourself they're gonna notice because then they definitely can't hear you <laughs> oh so, so it's like almost like you play softer mm -hmm. so that they'll play softer exactly that's like some uh jedi mind trick stuff so in my mixing experience <laughs> upright has always had more attack thump and less sustain is that an issue with recording technique or the quality of the instruments or is it a characteristic of the upright as an instrument compared to an electric bass guitar that's such a good question um i would honestly say that all starts with the player i think you can like categorically get more sustained like longer notes out of an electric purely because it's amplified and you can get more gain out of it and all that stuff but you should if you're recording an upright player they should literally be able to be like and just let it go and a lot of that goes back to again just like finding the buzz and knowing exactly how much pressure to put down because again you're not deadening the string in any ways and um, you've got the right amount of bone on there. But when again, you like say bone, you're talking about literally the I'm, bone of your yeah, finger. Yeah, you can see where I'm at. Like you literally want to be on the bone because if you're anywhere down here, this is just a bunch of dead meat, and that's just gonna like you're gonna have an attack, but it's gonna die off really quick. <laughs> other universe to deal with um you know we were talking about it earlier like i i feel like most people can kind of pick up an upright and get around this way uh -huh. even without lessons or even just like kind of looking at online stuff i wouldn't recommend trying to do this without some kind of lessons or teacher around to kind of show you around because you can really do a lot of damage in your in your hand and your wrist and even like your forearm if you're holding this wrong is there anything else that you want to say to the the upright bass curious electric bass player if you're even thinking about it you owe it to yourself to try it again i wouldn't spend a bunch of money on it like try to borrow one from somebody um it's a worthwhile thing to do with your time you may get a lot out of it you may like it better than electric but you know if you don't do it you're not gonna know it's just something that like if you're curious about it now, you're always gonna be curious about it. It's not gonna go away. There's not a lot of upright bass players out there that can really do, you know, two or three hour gig and knock it out and not like be cramping and hurting and stuff. So like, there's work out there if you wanna go get it, you just gotta put some time in up front. But again, like if you're even thinking about it, if you have that itch, it's not gonna go away. So you might as, might as well scratch it. Thanks for hanging out today, Kelly. Uh, if people want to hear you play or support you or your music, how can they find you? How can they support you? Um, Instagram's probably best. Um, I'm at Kelly McCarty Music. You can hit me up in there. I do teach if you want to do like some online stuff. That'd be cool. I also have a funk band in town called Tracksuit Mafia. But yeah, that's probably the best way. Just DM me on there if you want to hang out. Huge thank you to Kelly for everything we learned today. I learned a bunch. What did you think? What do you think about upright bass? What didn't we say that, that should be said? There's so much more we could talk about. There's only so much we could put in one video, but I learned a bunch and I had a great time. So thank you, Kelly. Make sure to follow Kelly on social. Follow Kelly's band, Tracksuit Mafia. I actually know all of the musicians in that band. They're all amazing. So make sure to support live music. They're an Atlanta-based funk band. So check them out. And uh, if you want to get private lessons with Kelly, make sure to hit him up as well. If you want to support this channel, check out the base course. I have a link to that in the description. And uh, I had so much fun today. So thanks for hanging out and I'll see you on the next video.